What is up everybody, welcome back. So if you're anything like me, you're a massive fan of Avatar The Last Airbender. Very, very formative part of my childhood, an amazing show. I'm really, really excited for the live action Netflix that's coming out this week. And I'm also a little bit concerned to be quite honest because we haven't had the best experience with live action Avatar adaptations. But anyway, that's aside from the point. The reason I'm making this video is because there's been something that I've been thinking about for a really long time as it pertains to the Avatar The Last Airbender universe, and that is how do the genetics of deciding whether or not you're going to be a bender, and if you are a bender, what type of bender, which element you're actually going to bend, how does that all actually work? It seems like it could be really complicated because there's these four elements and then there's the axis of being a bender at all or not being a bender, but it also seems so intuitive and just like a natural extension from what we already know about genetics in our real world. And so that's what I want to unpack in this video. Seriously guys, I've been thinking about this topic on and off for the last year or so, and it seems like this is the perfect time to make this video. So we're gonna go off of something. We're gonna go off of this now authorless Reddit thread, which I'm gonna link in the description below. But that thread basically gives us a starting point and it says, hey, I think bending is determined by two genes. One that determines whether or not you are a bender at all. And the other, which if you are a bender, is going to determine which type of bender you are. And so that's where the thread kind of ends and that's where we're going to pick up the ball and roll from there. Let's start with that first gene whether or not you are going to be a bender. Now, just a quick bio refresher, because for me, it's been a really long time. I'm sure for many of you, it has as well. Each gene is going to have two or more different kinds of alleles in the population. And alleles are just different forms of the same gene. And so for our, are you a bender or are you not a bender gene? Let's assume that there are two alleles in the population, one called uppercase B, usually uppercase letters in genetics represent what are called dominant alleles and one called lowercase b, which in genetics are typically called recessive alleles. And they're called dominant and recessive alleles because typically in order to express the trait of the recessive allele, you need to receive that recessive allele from your dad and you need to receive that recessive allele from your mom. If you receive even one dominant allele from either your mom or your dad, then that recessive gene does not express itself in you. And so my first thought, thinking about all that and kind of thinking back to my biology 101 courses, is that, well, bending seems like this kind of rare thing as I watch the show. And so surely bending has got to be the recessive allele, right? So let's roll with that for a second. Let's assume that bending is the lowercase b allele and non-bending is the uppercase b allele. Let's see if that logic tracks with what we know in the show. So let's say that my mom is a bender and my dad is a bender. So using this framework, that means they both must have lowercase b's. That's the only way they both need to have that recessive bending allele for them to be benders. Now the way it works is that my mom is going to give me one of the alleles that she has, and my dad is going to be giving me one of the alleles that he has. It's really easy in this case because they could only give me a pair of lowercase b and lowercase b, which means that I am fated to be a bender as well because I got both of those recessive b alleles. Now that does not line up with something in the show. And what I mean is that, uh, this is a bit of a spoiler if you haven't watched the show, but Aang and Katara from the original show get married. Aang is obviously a bender, and Katara is obviously a bender, but they end up having a kid who is named Bumi, who actually ends up being a non-bender. So that kind of breaks our framework apart, and that means that what we assumed here is not correct. And so we're going to assume the opposite, actually, somewhat counterintuitively. We're gonna assume that bending now is actually the dominant allele. So uppercase B is what expresses bending, the dominant allele, and lowercase B is going to be the recessive non-bending allele. And so that is our first part of the story. We have the, are you a bender? Are you a not bender? Punnett square figured out right here. Now we get to maybe the more interesting part. Let's say that you are a bender. So you got an uppercase B from either your mom or your dad. What kind of bender are you going to be? Which element are you going to bend? Now it's important here to point out that just because you get one allele each from your mom or your dad, so you get two alleles total, doesn't mean that there's only two types of alleles for a given gene in the entire population. And so we're gonna take advantage of the fact and we're gonna say that there's actually gonna be four types of alleles for the gene that determines what kind of bender you're going to be. And as you guessed, we're picking four, one for air, one for water, one for fire, one for earth. Now that totally helps us with figuring out this framework, but it also makes it a little bit more complicated because our Punnett square for what kind of alleles you could receive from your mom and your dad is no longer a simple two by two one, 
that you might be used to seeing from your biology class, but it's a more complicated four by four one. And so we actually have a lot of cells to fill in and a lot of hypotheticals, like if I get an earth bending allele from my mom and a fire bending allele from my dad, what kind of bender am I going to be? The way we're going to resolve this is by taking a look at the relative populations of these benders in Avatar The Last Airbender. So what I mean is that airbenders seem to be the most rare, waterbenders are the next most common, firebenders seem to be the next most common, and earthbenders, having an entire earth kingdom, and it seems like there's these armies of earthbenders, seem to be the most common. And so we're going to use that ranking in order to fill out this Punnett square here. So what we mean is that the only way we're going to assume you're going to be an airbender is if you get that A allele from your mom and that A allele from your dad. That's the only way. Now, to be a waterbender, you have a couple of options. You could totally receive a W from your mom and a W from your dad. That's a no-brainer. But we're going to assume that the waterbending allele also overrides the airbending allele. So if I get an A from my mom and a W from my dad, I'm going to express as a waterbender. And we're going to follow that pattern, basically. So the next most common is firebender. We're going to assume that the firebender allele overrides everything except for the earthbender allele. And the earthbender allele actually overrides everything because that's the most common type of bender we see. So that's how we came up with this Punnett square, kind of looking at the distribution of the types of benders out there and filling out the square accordingly. So we've got a framework, folks. We have a framework that tells us whether or not you're going to be a bender. We've got that gene figured out. And we also got the gene figured out that tells you what kind of bender you're going to be. By the way, I really like this framework because it allows for really interesting things. Like, uh, riddle me this. So let's say that your dad is an airbender. We know that the only way that's possible is that if he has an AA allele. So your dad's an airbender. Now let's say that your mom is an earthbender. And let's say that she has alleles E and W. So that makes total sense so far. Now you might see where I'm going with this, but your dad's going to give you that A allele, guaranteed. And there's a 50% chance that your mom is going to give you that W allele, making you have an AW. And if we look at our square here, that's actually going to make you a waterbender. And so that's how you can have these cool things where your dad's an airbender, your mom is an earthbender, and you end up being a waterbender. So it just kind of expands the horizon of what's possible and seems like something that would happen in this universe. And so there's our framework figured out the only thing left to do and for me to justify that this is still a data science video is that we're going to run Monte Carlo simulations where we seed our hypothetical population with a small group of people from these different uh, having different alleles of what we just talked about and see what happens if these things stabilize in the long run after all these people reproduce and we have a thousand people in the population. So our first simulation we're going to start with eight men and eight women they're gonna have parallel sets of alleles. It's just that eight of them are men, eight of them are women. So let's just look at the men here. So uh, we're going to assume that we have four benders, one of each type, and we're gonna have four non-benders, but those non-benders carry the alleles necessary for air, water, earth, and fire. And so those non-benders can actually end up having children who are benders uh, based on the alleles that they're carrying. By the way, this is probably a good point that I'm not a biologist. I probably said a hundred wrong things by now. If anyone is a biologist, please point that out in the comment section below so we can all learn together and not be uh, misinformed by my terrible terminology. Anyway, uh, back to what I was saying. So we're going to assume we have these eight people. We're going to let them reproduce. And after we have a thousand people, we actually find really interestingly that things stabilize. We end up having a stable 70% of the population ends up as benders. And as for the breakdown of what types of benders these people are, it's about a 60, 30, 10, and very, very small percentage breakdown of earth, fire, water, and air. Now, this doesn't seem too correct. I think it's basically impossible that 70% of the population is benders by watching the show. It seems more like in the five to like maximum 15% range. So let's adjust the initial parameters of our simulation to line up more with reality. And so instead of having this one-to-one -one correspondence of an airbender and a non-bender carrying the airbender alleles, we're gonna assume that there's a one to 15 correspondence, which seems a lot more in line with the distributions we're seeing, where we have one airbender in the initial population and we have 15 non-benders who are carrying those airbender alleles. And if we do that, we find something more reasonable in the long term, which is that 15% of the population ends up as benders. In reality, if I was running the simulation again, I think I'd bias that even further in the direction of non-benders because 15 still seems kind of high, but better than 70 for sure. And as for the breakdown, we find that it's a 45, 30, 20, Five, breakdown of uh, earth, fire, water, 
care. So hopefully you enjoyed this video. No idea if this theoretical framework is correct. It's been really fun to think through, if anything. If you have kind of holes in this framework that you found, or if you have a different framework that you want to propose, I'd be really curious. I've been thinking about this again for, for over a year on and off, and so I'm really interested to hear how you would approach this problem. If you like this video, please like and subscribe for more videos just like this one here, and I'll see all you wonderful folks next time. And I really hope the series is good. I don't want a repeat of 2010. See ya.